Hi all you Spurs folks out there. My name is Eric Detweiler and I'm currently a graduate student here at UT studying rhetoric. I'm also an instructor in the Spurs program this year and I'm here today to talk to you about a rhetorical concept called Kairos. I'm going to start off by asking you to imagine a couple of situations with me. First off, let's pretend you're a musician. Maybe you are a musician, but if you're not, pretend with me here. Let's say you are a singer or you play an instrument. It's the night of a big performance one you've been preparing and practicing for for months. And you have a major solo. Your solo is in the middle of an upbeat song, but that song is the third song in your band's set. Before it, there are two other slower, more mellow tunes that'll give you and the audience a chance to get warmed up a little. But as you're watching the audience arrive, you notice that everyone's moving a little slow. Let's say it's a rainy evening, the end of a long week. These people look worn out. You realize that if you start with a couple of slower songs, you're going to lose this audience. They're going to zone out, they're going to fall asleep, they just aren't going to be moved. So you get everyone in the band together and you say, okay, look guys, I know this might sound selfish, but we have got to start with my big song. We've got to wake these folks up and get them moving from the start or they aren't even going to hear our quieter stuff. The other musicians look around, they see the audience, they see what you mean. So you all change the order of the songs, putting yours first, and when the audience is settled in, you start it up. The crowd starts perking up, tapping their toes, they love it. And by the end of the song, they're swept up in the music and ready to listen to whatever else you throw at them. On to our second situation. This one's going to be about sports. Now, I know we're in Texas, so I should probably talk about football, but I grew up in Kentucky, where basketball is a much bigger deal. So that's what I know, that's what I'm going to go with. Imagine a college basketball player who has the ball in a big game. There are just a few minutes left and the player is right at the half-court line. Consider all the variables that player has to be aware of as she decides what to do with the ball. How much time is left in the game? How much on the shot clock? Where are her teammates? How tired is the other team? What's the coach shouting at me? How many fouls do I have? Are we winning or losing? All these factors affect what that player needs to do, what the situation calls for. But eventually, she's probably going to want to find an opening, a gap in the defense, a space between two opposing players that she can pass or drive through in order to get the ball to the basket and get her team some points. Now, you might be wondering why I laid out these two scenes. It's because both are examples of what people who work in rhetoric call kairos. Now, kairos is an ancient Greek word that means a certain sort of time. Not the time on a clock, 4.27 p.m., 7 in the morning, the Greeks called that chronos, sort of like our word chronological. Kairos, however, was a different sort of time. It was a window of opportunity, the ideal moment to accomplish something, to persuade an audience, to carry out an action. Making use of kairos required a person to be aware of the situation at hand, highly skilled and adaptable at whatever they wanted to carry out. It's what the musician and the basketball player, in the examples I gave just a minute ago, have to be able to make use of. The musician has to be tuned in to the moods and the needs of his audience and skilled enough as a musician to change up the list of songs on the fly. The basketball player has to be able to react quickly and appropriately to all sorts of possible situations in the game. To be effective at what they do, both have to be able to keep an eye out for and make use of openings. So chronological time, whether a concert's at 8 o'clock in the evening on a Thursday or 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday might matter to these performers, but it's only one variable that's a part of a much more complicated kairos. Let me try one other angle here, building on our basketball story. The Greeks actually made a specific connection between kairos and sports. In fact, one Greek artist made a sculpture of what he thought kairos would look like if it was a person with a body, and that sculpture was placed at the entrance to a sports stadium. Here's Kairos. He looks goofy, but let's cut him some slack and try to understand his appearance. If you look close, you'll see that he's balancing a set of scales on a razor with one hand. Now, I don't know about you all, but I can't even balance a pencil on my finger, much less a razor with a heavy set of scales balanced on it. What that shows is that Kairos has great balance. He's a sharp guy who's so skilled and tuned into the world around him that he can balance a razor's edge. And he's fast. Not only does he have big wings, he's got extra smaller wings on his feet for some bonus speed. And there's his goofy haircut. 
Notice that he's bald in the back and then has that one long lock of hair near the front. The point there is that to be able to make use of Kairos, to grab hold of that opportune moment, a person has to be quick and always ready. You have one shot to grab that lock of hair and seize the moment. Once you miss it, it's gone. There's no hair on the back of that head for you to grab onto, no second chance. Once a band plays the first song, there's no going back to whatever opportunities were open before the concert started. If the basketball player misses a momentary opening in the defense, there's no going back. You can wait for Kairos to give you another opening and make another pass, but you don't get a second chance at the exact same circumstances. Kairos is also important for someone making an argument, whether it's a student in a rhetoric class, President Obama, or a teenager trying to convince a parent to make tacos instead of spaghetti for dinner. Take the admissions policy at the University of Texas. As I record this video, it's spring 2013, and students who were in the Spurs program this spring will be reading and writing about a Supreme Court case that could have an impact on how UT chooses who gets into the university. Right now, race plays a very small factor in those choices. A white student who didn't get into UT, however, thinks that's unfair. That student, Abigail Fisher, took UT to court to challenge the school's ability to consider race as it decides who gets admitted. As of today, the Supreme Court has heard the case but hasn't yet announced their decision. The lawyers in that case, whether they were arguing on behalf of Abigail Fisher or defending the University of Texas, had a lot of factors to consider. The political beliefs of the judges who make up the Supreme Court, past judgments about similar court cases, the history of race in America, and in education, Abigail Fisher's other qualifications, and their opponents' arguments. Whether the chronos for their argument was 9 in the morning or 3 in the afternoon, they had to be highly aware of and ready to make use of all the details of the situation in order to make use of Kairos. And once the Supreme Court makes that decision, that Kairos will forever be changed. Future lawyers and citizens might continue to argue that race should or shouldn't play a factor in university admissions, but they'll never be able to do so effectively without considering the outcome of Fisher versus the University of Texas. That Kairos will have passed. And so if you're a student in RHE 306, you'll have your own set of variables to consider. What's the history of the issue I'm arguing about? What's its current state? Who's my audience, and are they excited or bored about this issue? How will they perceive my credibility, my ethos, as I make my case? Like a musician deciding which song to perform or a basketball player looking for a lane to the backboard, a person making an argument has to both practice constantly and keep their eyes, ears, and ability to use language sharp if she or he wants to get a hold of Kairos before he, before the opportunity presented by any given situation, flies away. All right, that's all I got for you. Thanks for listening, and good luck with all your arguments this semester.